Today, there's, there are really lots and lots of different remote sensing instruments that are available for use, everything from uh, satellites to aircraft to uh, small UAVs. And uh, the question is, what information do you need and at what spatial and time scale determines which of these things maybe you use. Also, there's a cost issue. Uh, many of the satellites, let's see, do I, have, I do have a pointer. Um, uh, the, the traditional ones, the multispectral ones, are Landsat and, and Sentinel-2. Sentinel-2 is a fairly new one. Landsat's been around since the 1970s. It's, it's uh, operated by the USGS, uh, and it's a public domain instrument, so the cost of the data is free. It has 30 meter pixels, which are often too large for, you know, real field management use. So the question is, is that, is that a reasonable scale? The data comes every 16 days. So the other question is, what happens if it's cloudy on the day it flies over and so you don't get data for a month or more than a month? So that's one of the uh, limitations of using that data. Sentinel-2 is a newer instrument. Uh, it's a pair of satellites that are operated by the European Space Agency. They're also public domain, so they're free for us to use. And uh, they come every five days. Uh, they also have higher spatial resolution. I'll go into that a little bit more later. Um, um, but uh, kind of similar bands of uh, half a dozen or eight, eight or so bands to use. Uh, at a finer scale, we have commercial satellites that have kind of down at the meter scale or even sub-meter scale uh, information, but there you have to pay for them. They don't necessarily, well, they can point them so they, depending on what orbit they're in, they can measure stuff from, from um, at, a, at a low angle and get data for you, but that isn't always good quality data, so there's some issues with using uh, these instruments, but they, um, but they're widely used and they're uh, available at very high spatial resolution. Um, generally, manned aircraft are everything in between. Typically, the spatial scales are are in the sub five meter scale, so one, two, three, four, five meter uh, size pixels, and they have the same kinds of instruments that these satellites have but flown on aircraft, so you have to contract with someone to fly it. And uh, uh, that you know, can be expensive for, for uh, data collection. On the other hand, there are other types of data that are available on manned aircraft that aren't available from satellite. Uh, probably for, for vineyards, it's not so important to have LIDAR data. LIDAR is really good at measuring the structural properties of the vegetation, so it's more widely used in orchards and in, in natural uh, forests and so on. But uh, it's a type of uh, technology that's widely used on aircraft, but it's, uh, the, the lasers burn out in space, and so we don't really have one right now. Um, the other type of, uh, two other types of data that are more common on aircraft than satellite are hyperspectral imagery, and I'll go into that a little bit more, but it just means that you measure a whole spectrum across the solar part of the electromagnetic spectrum, the visible and the near-infrared, and you measure many, many spectral bands. So often, some of the instruments now are in the four or 500 uh, spectral bands across that interval, so you get, say, two or three nanometer, very small wavelength resolution, so you can very accurately measure an absorption feature that's in the vegetation. Something that would be of interest for water management is that water has absorption features in the, in the infrared part of the spectrum, and you can use that information to manage your crops, and I'll show you some examples in a few minutes. I guess the third part, kind of technology that's more available on aircraft is, is thermal imagery, and that also has applications for water management because as the, when the stomata close, or partially close, the canopy heats up, and you see spatial patterns in, in your uh, vineyards or in your orchards, too, that relate to how much water is available to, the, to that vine, and it'll get warmer as it, as it gets more water stress. And so you can use that temperature differences to monitor them. 
Lastly, a lot of people are interested in UAVs now. I don't have too many good examples of it, but so typically the people are working with very small UA. I usually call them UASs. U, U, unmanned aerial vehicles or unmanned aerial systems, <laughs> depending on which choice of words you want to use. Uh, they have generally are multispectral instruments. They usually have, for instance, four bands blue, green, and red in the visible in a near-infrared band. But, uh, and they have super fine spatial resolution that typically uh, ones that are people working with it at campus are, are in the centimeter scale. You know, so like something like that. Uh, spatial resolution, but it gets to be sometimes hard to analyze the data. And when you have to mosaic the flight lines together, you get a lot of resampling of the pixels, and so it's, it's uh, hard to interpret other than the spatial patterns. So there's probably, uh, that's a technology that's rapidly evolving, and that won't be true in a few years, but it is true right now. So I assume that most people, when they want to monitor the water status of their, of their vines now, they typically, or I assume you probably typically use water, water potential measuring pressure bond measurements, is that? one of the techniques you're using. I mean, it's been around for, <laughs> I, I did three years of pre-dawn pressure bond measurements as a graduate student, so I'm quite familiar with this technique. <laughs> and it's very accurate, but, well, it's, it, it is subject to some, you know, investigator uh, measurement differences where they, where they determine when the water bubble gets up to, the air bubble gets up to the top, but, uh, it's the issue with using this kind of measurement is you can't measure very many vines, you know, very many leaves. So it really leaves you with accurate knowledge of particular points, but not your whole field. Uh, the, uh, the other kind of technique a lot of people use is, is uh, uh, with having meteorological sensors for um, measuring a, uh, either weather station data or eddy covariance uh, uh, measurements with measuring carbon and water fluxes. And these are also very accurate and they give you a, a spatial information, they give you information covering a large area but you don't know where in the field there are differences, right? You, it may, the, the footprint of your measurement may be something like the size of your field but it's not necessarily you don't know where in the field it's, maybe water status is better and where it's worse. So then remote sensing can help you to deal with that issue because uh, you're measuring every, normally every pixel. So this is just a, a nice vineyard. You can also walk through your fields and try to assess them boom by eye. And I think lots of people do that. But uh, in this particular field, you have a lot of, heterogeneity of the, of the vine development. And presumably some of that might be due to, to differences in water stress. Uh, and so you can uh, use, you can, you can measure in this case uh, uh, water potential using a pressure bomb, uh, you know, like every so many, uh, so much distance and then create a, a a map from from those measurements and try to estimate where you have uh, uh, high water potentials, meaning low stress, and low water potentials, right, more negative, where where they're higher stress. And uh, and as you can see, there's this is, shows the topography, and you you know where 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 the topography is maybe steeper, and it's and, and the soils are more sandy, it'll drain out, and you have water stress earlier than other parts of your field. So another kind of measurement that's been around for a long time is color infrared imagery. And it's been around, uh, well, really since World War II. Uh, it was used to identify camouflage uh, by people putting dead branches on military equipment to, to hide them. And then what happens when they, you do that? Of course, they dry out. And as they dry out, they change color. And so you can use, and what they're changing, what the color, what they're doing is they shifted the, 
the colors that are displayed, the true color would be measured in the green part of the spectrum that your eye sees in green, in red, and then in near infrared that you don't see with your eye, but you can, you can either do it in a camera and print it and, uh, and, and get a paper copy, or you can do it in a computer and display the near infrared band in the red color plane. And you get an image like this, where the, vine, where the vines are healthy, they're bright red, and where they're less healthy or they're sparser, uh, they, they will be uh, uh, a lighter red color. And so you can just use the color tone differences to see uh, information about the, how the plants are growing. And what they're, what they're really seeing is how much leaf area there is on those vines. The more leaf area you have, the more green leaf area you have, the, the brighter the near infrared will be, and so the brighter the red color will be. And this uh, little graph is just to show you, this is the part of the spectrum we see with our eyes. It's pretty small from 0.4 to 0.7 microns. A microns is a sixth of a meter, so I mean, a one millimeter, it's, it's a, a millionth of a, of a meter. Uh, and the near infrared is just beyond what we see with our eyes. It's in this uh, very, just, just beyond that. And then as you get into longer wavelengths, uh, this out to about here to about three microns, that's the part of the spectrum that we can see where the sun has a lot of input into the atmosphere and to reaches the ground on Earth. So we can measure that with different instruments, even though we don't see it with our eyes. Beyond that, you're getting into the thermal infrared. So thermal data is measuring the emissions, the emission, the energy emission that's coming from the surface that's due to the temperature of that surface. And we can measure that with uh, thermal infrared instruments. So people have for a long time used Landsat data uh, to, to look at crop patterns. But generally, they have used them to see where the density of the crop is uh, because of this uh, near infrared relationship with leaf area. Leaf area. And uh, the spatial resolution, because it's 30 meters, uh, often isn't good enough to see uh, resolution to understand where, where the plants are water stressed. But this example uh, is something that was done uh, at uh, uh, Gallo, uh, one of the Gallo uh, vineyards, research vineyards. And they used a combined Landsat data with a uh, a model of, that estimates evapotranspiration called metric. How many of you guys have ever heard of that? Have you ever, yeah, so you, you know, they, so they use the, the Landsat data to, to make a map of where the vegetation density varies, and then they use the data to get the, hot, the hottest and the coldest pixels, and that scales the evapotranspiration into that range. Anyway, so that's, that's what they're, we're doing. This little graph down here shows you where Landsat has bands. Where This is Landsat 7, and that, the upper level is the Landsat 8. That's the newest one. About the end of this year, we should launch Landsat 9. So when that happens, we'll have 8 and, eight and 9 will be operating. So instead of every 16 days, they'll be every 8 days. And the Sentinel-2 data, from the European Space Agency is in the same orbit and comes over at the same time as Landsat. So since it's free to us, and it's actually being distributed by USGS and NASA, uh, that means we could have data every two, about two to three days by combining both the Sentinel data and the Landsat data. So you have the opportunity to, uh, to use them to, to get a you know, more, more rapid updates of what the water stress or water status is of your crops. Uh, this example, <laughs> it shows you for a time series for two crops at Russell Ranch, which is a research facility uh, that people at Davis work, work at. And this shows for maize on the left. And you see in, uh, in uh, May, it's kind of the growth starts out. It's, we didn't have any data in between, then it kind of peaks in, in June, and 
then it shows the change over the growing season. The one on the right shows tomatoes. I don't have one for, for uh, grapes, unfortunately. Uh, but you can see, you can see very, very um, uh, uh, many different uh, data points on there that cover over the summer. And w there were high correlations for pretty much predicting the yield for, uh, for corn and for tomatoes any time after June. So right, basically when it peaks for row crops anyway, it usually is a pretty good indicator of what the, what the um, final yield is going to be. And the graph on the bottom shows Sentinel-2 is different than Landsat. Landsat has 30 meter bands. Sentinel-2 has these four bands, blue, green, and red, and near infrared at 10 meters. And it also has another set of bands at 20 meter pixels. So it has these four bands in what's called the, the red edge, varying the, how steep the slope is from the chlorophyll absorption in the red to high reflectance in the near infrared. They, they're measuring that, the slope of that line across there, and that's also another indicator of health or, or growth rate. And then it has two bands like Landsat in the shortwave infrared. And then these bands at 60 meters are used for calibration primarily. Uh, so one advantage of the Sentinel data is it's much higher spatial resolution. So instead of every pixel being 30 meters, you could have these bands at 10 meters and these bands at 20 meters. So you could get more resolution of your crop. <coughs> So most people use uh, NDVI, which is, how many, any, have any of you heard of that term, NDVI? Yeah. So it's the Normalized Difference Vegetation Index, and it's taking the, the value of the near infrared minus the value of reflectance in the red band, and then dividing by the sum of those two reflectance values. And that normalization kind of takes care of some Albedo differences that would be due to slope, slope and aspect differences. Um, and it's a pretty good indicator of how much green vegetation you have out there. And you, here you see in this, this is Russell Ranch with its, I think, 96 or 96 one acre plots. And within these different pixels, uh, there are many pixels. The, 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 the dots are the size of the pixels for the 10 meter bands for Sentinel-2. So what about more directly measuring water? Uh, as I say, every, what happens when your plants are water stressed? Obviously, they, they can wilt, but you'd like to water them before that happens. And, uh, and so that's the main thing that changes NDVI, is if the leaves drop or they wilt, that will reduce the surface area that's being measured, and so your value will go down. But uh, the plants are much more, uh, in the infrared, there's water absorption bands, just like the chlorophyll bands in the visible, that can measure how much water is there. And they're much more sensitive to, uh, to changes in water content before usually the plant gets to the point where it's dropping leaves or it's, it's uh, or they're, um, uh, wilted. So in this graph you see this is what NDVI looks like for these orchards. This is down in the San Joaquin Valley. Actually at Paramount Farms, one of their orchards, if you know them. Uh, and this is a, a young pistachio orchard. It has in this uh, display the, uh, the yellow has less, less uh, leaf area than the red. And, and it's a, because it's a young orchard, it's not as mature as the almond orchards. And you see how wonderfully uniform their, their management is that they grow them and they're all bright red and it doesn't look like there's any difference. But if you look at the difference in the water content of those leaves, you start to see, you know, there's a lot more heterogeneity. And you also see these patterns of these kind of banding, like here, here, and here. You see those kind of three three bands, that's how they irrigate. They, they don't irrigate the whole uh, row of the fields at once, they irrigate them by thirds. And so you see from the most recent irrigation to the, you know, to uh, fields that 
are still coming up to a irrigation schedule. So that's pretty easy to do, and NDWI can be done with Sentinel-2 or with Landsat if the resolution's good enough. And it's just like NDVI, you just do a normalized ratio. You divide the shortwave infrared minus the near infrared and divide, divide by the sum of those two. So it's totally the same. Uh, another kind of data that also shows these patterns is ther the thermal image. So as I said, as, you're, as, you're, as the water status goes down and the plants start to be stressed, they, uh, the, they have uh, higher temperatures. So in this case, you start to see some of those patterns showing up the same way as the, wa as the water content uh, patterns. So this was airborne data, uh, mainly, uh, but, but you could also do it with satellite data. We did have a project down in the, uh, San Joaquin looking at table grapes uh, uh, with another airborne sensor, a NASA project. And this grower was willing to water stress these fields for five days of mild, what was considered a mild water stress compared to the fields to the north of it, and uh, 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 to see what, what happened. And so after five, um, I don't have the date for this image, but uh, with just a five day reduction in, in, in irrigation, not a complete drop of irrigation, but just a reduction, and I don't remember the, the, <laughs> the the actual value right now, because it was a while back. But uh, uh, this, anyway, I guess this does show you what the, the difference between the, the, the change in the, in the soil, uh, the, the soil matrix potential, water potential, is much, was much higher here than in the southern ones. And at the beginning, they don't look much different nor do they look too different in the color infrared. But then you go a little bit farther, like a month. So a month later, so the plots on the left show a morning and an afternoon image in, uh, um, in May. Where's the date on it? Oh, in May 20th. And then, uh, so this is a morning image for the plot that was untreated, the control and the treated water stress plot, and then for the afternoon of the May 20th, and then in a April 30th, a month later, you see another. So you really see the effect of that uh, rather small reduction in irrigation. <coughs> um, and this is showing the, the canopy water content in in quantitative units, in kilograms per meter, uh, meter square. So you, you can see that even a, sometimes a small reduction, especially in the spring when the, when the canopy is still expanding, has a huge impact. And for this particular treatment, at the end of the growing season, you can see that both the cluster weight of the, of the grapes and the and the weight, uh, it, really went, it really had a big impact on the, on the growth and production of the fruit. Uh, in another study, uh, we looked at the sensitivity of, of two different varieties of grapes to uh, water stress uh, in, in over at different times in the, in the growing season. So these are the stages that the vines were at and what the consequences were to the, to the uh, sensitivity to the water stress. So having a way to monitor these things in, in, uh, uh, in um, uh, fairly rapid you know, time, time sequence is really helpful. So what I've been showing you mostly is is data from this kind of a Landsat-like sensor where you have a few bands, uh, blue, green, and red, and a near-infrared, and then two bands in the shortwave infrared, and with different reflectances, different, different magnitude of reflectance, 
um, in this case for different plant species. But if you have a, a full spectrum like you do with hyperspectral data, you measure the whole spectrum, you get a lot more detail about what's actually going on with the, with the canopy. <coughs> So we did a water stress experiment on uh, some uh, uh, Pinot Noir grapes in, in uh, Caneros and looked at, uh, in this case from, from the ground, looked at the individual response of, of individual leaves to either uh, water, water stress or no water stress. And the water stress is based on what the water potential measurements are of the individual vines. And you see quite clearly the, this pattern for the healthy leaves, which is, has very low values in the visible part of the spectrum, and then it goes up high in the near infrared, and then in the short wave infrared. And the leaves that were dried out or were quite, quite severely water stressed. They lost a lot of water. So the water, when, when water is absorbing a lot, of course, the canopy is very dark in this part of the spectrum, right? Because the light's all being absorbed, even if we can't see it with our eyes. And when you have less water, the reflectance is much higher, and you start having these other absorption features. For the dry matter part of things in the, in the leaves, the, the cellulose and lignin and nitrogen and other materials. And then the same thing shows when we, when we looked at it uh, from slightly above the canopies, uh, you still saw the, 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 the clear evidence of the stress in the near infrared, even if it wasn't as, uh, as uh, significant when it was looked at from above. So this is looked at from the side, well, from individual leaves. So uh, having, having a, uh, this kind of data can really help you. And it is available on aircraft. And it is available on UAVs, but I don't think the data quality is so good on the UAV instruments because they're so, they're so small, the, the, the necessity to make them lightweight and small has uh, resulted in a poor data quality right now. So you can also fly over your vines with uh, thermal sensors to look at ther you know, evidence of water stress from the temperature. And this just shows you a, a canopy that's, that has 100% of its uh, evapotranspiration needs met. And it has these low temperatures. So it's cool because that means its water is evaporating from, you know, from transpiration. Then one with 50% of the potential evapotranspiration re requirement. And you start to see some higher values um, in, in the canopy, higher temperatures. And then when you're at 25%, you really see a huge difference in the, in the increase in temperature in the canopy. So these, these sensors aren't too expensive, and you can fly them on both UAVs and manned aircraft. And uh, having the high spatial resolution really helps you to get in the middle of the row. Uh, because when you get out to the edges, you start getting shadows and other things that in background from the soil and things that affect it. So really, the, you want to look at the data in the middle of the row, not at the edges so much. <coughs> uh, so you know you can start to put these things together and uh, identify regions that you know, have, have uh, where you're going to do various kinds of harvest. This would be for a, a, a row crop type field. but you know, for for this purpose, you're trying to look at where the where there's incipient water stress. Obviously, for wine grapes, you want them slightly stressed, but not very stressed. And so, being able to monitor that very closely, and you don't really need to have a quantitative. You don't really need to know how many kilograms of water is in the canopy. What you really need to know is what the spatial pattern is, so that that you can plan to do, how you can plan to irrigate. So uh, this is just an example of, you know, using a small manned aircraft to, to uh, the, this is a fluorescent uh, uh, sensor for thermal, uh, thermal emission and a, a small, um, uh, this is a small uh, 
uh, hyperspectral imager. It happens to be from Headwell. They weigh about a little over a pound. And so they can go into a small plane quite easily. Uh, these are pretty good instruments. They're expensive, but they have a, a, a good quality data. Uh, there, are other, there are a number of other brands out there now. Corning has a new one. Corning, Corning Glass has a manufacturing place in Sacramento, and they do that. <laughs> and they have a new one. I forget. It's called a Shark or something. But it uh, has good quality data. And then you can get, you know, create these maps of where you're, what the water status is. And, and if you have ability to manage your irrigation, then you can respond to those changes. Uh, the kind of last example I want to go into is, so here's a, a field that has uh, quite a bit of difference in conditions over the course, over the field and how to, how to measure that. They're partly due to different types of ir irrigation. So from some airborne data, we have, we have, uh, this is the, this is the, the field and you see with the, uh, what I was saying that if you just look at the central part of the row, you get a pretty good measure of what the canopy condition is. So when you get to the edges, you're starting to get a mixture of return, re reflectance being returned from the ground and from um, the shaded parts in the understory. And it does make a, a difference what spatial resolution you're at because you start getting more and more mixing when the when the pixels get too big, so you're mixing the, the, the inner row spaces, the, say the thermal temperature of that with what's in the canopy, and you tend to, since the row spaces are pretty wide, you tend to drown out the, the signal. So you want to have the signal at the scale where you have potentially multiple pixels within each row. So, you know, fairly high, I would say something in the, you know, maybe a quarter of a meter, you know, 25 centimeters, which is, I don't know, like that, <laughs> that, that size, pixels, would be a, approximately a good size for, for doing these more vertical rows structure. And then once you measure those things, you can look at the, you, there are various ways of, of analyzing the data, but looking at the temperature versus the water potential, and you can usually get a quite good correlation. The same is true if you if you plotted the uh, the uh, uh, water indexes from the optical part of the spectrum against water potential, you would also get good regressions. So you can use those chain those differences to estimate what your what your water potential should be. And actually, that's what this is. Uh, this this index CWSI is just a water index, like I showed before, versus uh, water potential. And, that's been shown in quite a few different studies now that you get a pretty good linear relationship. Uh, so then you can plot your data like this and say, look at where is it stressed and where is it not stressed, and how. And then that lets you try to sit, figure out what, how could you mod modify the irrigation um, regime to take, you know, to take that into account and better, better manage it. So here's just trying to look at how do you map out then the 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 uh, how you would how you divide up your field into different sectors to to do different management, and then um, you can end up with something like this where you're plotting the how much you know the green the green dots are you know high water potential low water stress. And the yellow obviously are in between, and the red mean you probably should irrigate pretty soon in those areas. And just uh, another hey, minute or so, since I got a couple minutes left. <laughs> okay, I have six minutes, right? Four minutes? I don't know. Whatever. <laughs> so, okay, uh, the UAVs. There, there are lots of UAVs out there. There, you know, have. The larger sizes can carry more weight or for, and can be operated for a longer period of time, so they give you a better potential to, to make measurements, but lots of people are using real tiny ones. And with just a, a visible, like the kind of camera you have in your cell phone, 
and making images and putting them together to look at spatial patterns in their field. And, and sometimes that, if that's all you need, then that's, that's pretty easy because it's not too expensive solution. But if you want, need to know, like you really want to use the, 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 one of the water indexes to decide where to irrigate, the problem with these measurements is that you have to mosaic a whole bunch of flight lines together. And when you do that, you, en you end up uh, resampling the pixels that are in the flight lines to account for the kind of spaghetti-like look of the individual <laughs> uh, uh, flight lines. And so then you lose that, that, uh, the, the, the information quality in, in the data. But you, you do get nice imagery of the spatial patterns. And if that's sufficient, then that's all you need to do. Uh, another example for using a, a small UAV is that you can find, sometimes you can find patterns like this that have to do with, you know, there's a leak here and it kind of affected all these rows around it. And so you can maybe, uh, or the opposite can be the case that something's plugged up and, you know, the, it's not getting irrigated and then you'd see it either with the temperature or with the water index. And uh, Ken Giles, who's a professor in bio and ag engineering at Davis, had a nice quote about where if it's, if it's boring and repetitive and dangerous, you should use a drone. <laughs> that, that is a good example of where some other issues, maybe that's not the best choice. Anyway, I want to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer questions. And I can tell you, if you have questions about different kinds of instruments or different kinds of platforms, I have a lot of experience, and I'm happy to answer them. Yeah. Well, we are uh, overwhelmed with NDVI-based imagery <laughs> and the, the magic that NDVI could do in, in, in guiding irrigation management and my variegated pines and orchards. So I'll tell you, what you see as a main limitation of NDVI, and, and, I'm, and I'm talking about early stage, mid stage, and late stage, especially yeah. you know, early irrigation and late uh, season irrigation, because I... I have seen a lot of, lot of misunderstanding in the in, in sensitivity. Well, for one thing, uh, the sensitivity of, of that index um, is very good if you're in the early stages of growth. So something between it, the plants have just leafed out and up to about an LAI of three or four. But when you get past that, that index tends to saturate. So if your crop has an LAI of five or six or seven, you, any change that happens, you're not detecting. So that would be one problem, because late in the season, you have more <laughs> leaves on your, on your vines. Uh, then the other, another problem is, like I showed with those um, almond orchards, the leaf area index doesn't change unless the stress is really quite severe uh, is severe enough to cause the leaves to wilt. If they wilt, they don't have as much visible exposure to the, you know, to the platform, so they don't, you know, it shows it as a decline in, in NDVI, or if the leaves drop. But you, nobody wants to water. Wait till that happens to water. So you'd like to be able to see it at a at a stage when the leaves aren't so badly stressed that they that they are either senescing or or wilting. And so having a water index gives you that sensitivity. And since normally you would have the, band, the, the bands necessary to do NDVI on the same instrument, then you can have both kinds of data together and make an easier interpretation. What about wet soil and cover crop? <laughs> well, that's a problem. <laughs> so wet soil makes the soil darker. So it can increase the the contrast with your crop, with your with your vines. But the cover crop, it becomes hard to tell whether you're looking at the the vine itself or you're looking at the some combination of the vine and what's on the ground. The cover crop, if it's green. So once it dries out, like if you have a grass cover crop or alfalfa or something, once it dries out, the the spectral 
the spectral signature of gr dry grass or dry alfalfa or whatever cover crop you have is totally different than, uh, than the live green leaves. And so it's pretty easy to tell them apart when it's dry, but not when, it's, what, not when they're all green. You overestimate your, how much, leaf, how much uh, plant material you have when you have a, an understory of green material. Yes? Uh, well, it's easy enough to get the data because it's free, and you can in at the at the USGS. I haven't actually gone to do this for Sentinel data, so I, but I think I assume it's the same. Uh, the Earth Explorer thing at, at the USGS website lets you clip out the area that you want, so you can locate your fields, and then you don't have to get. 185 kilometers by 185 kilometers. You can just clip out the piece you want, and 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 you can just usually, if it's more current, reasonably current data, you can just usually download it because it's small enough uh, piece of data to do that. But I, I think the question is, how, what would you choose? Oh, what kind of image, image or what kind of indicator to use or vegetation index to use to detect differences right. or? Oh. Um, well, uh, I would probably, I mean, right now the, uh, the if, if 10 meter pixels is good enough for you, uh, that I would use the Sentinel data because it's quite good quality data and it's available to us at no cost. Well, you can use it both ways. You can just use the variation in the in the spectral values to look at the spatial pattern in your field, but you can combine it with a model like metric or uh, uh, other types of ET models. Uh, JPL has one on, that's with Priestley Taylor one that, that's available, and and then Susan Anderson at USGS at the USGS in Menlo Park. Has, I mean. Uh, Whatever in the East Coast, <laughs> uh, they have they, they they have that dyslexy model. Di it's this disaggregated alexi model. That's what they're trying to say with dyslexy, uh, and it's it works with Landsat data or with Sentinel data. So there there's a few models out there that uh, you could use to further analyze your data. But sometimes, like I said, it's not always necessary for you to know precisely what the how many grams of water there is in the canopy is to know where in your, because most people aren't irrigate, well, I don't know, maybe you should tell me. I, I, I was going to say most people don't irrigate at the vine level, but, uh, but blocks. And so if you know, uh, and if you know that, well, that part of the field that's showing up as being drier is more sandy and it's a little steeper and there's more runoff and whatever, you can, you know, you can just use that pattern to decide, well, I need the water sooner over here than over there. Uh, there is a, I would say this, I should have said that the state has the program called CIMIS. Have you ever used that? Yeah. So the spatial CIMIS program is now with the new goes, the new geostationary satellites is 500 meter pixels. And so that, you know, is not probably small enough, but it might be, it, it's much, the old data was four kilometer by four kilometers, now it's 500 meters by 500 meters, and, and we produce that, <laughs> and have since 2002 for the state, so. Uh, Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah, uh, where, where are we at in terms of uh, remote sensing of like nutritional conditions? <laughs> uh, it's, um, I would say it's really still pretty researchy, but definitely people are trying to do things. Often what happens is you, you know, you go out and you, you collect leaves from parts of your field you think are, might be water, have a, say, a nitrogen deficiency or phosphorus or something, and then 
and you get those leaves analyzed and then other parts that you think are healthier. And normally the, what happens if you have a pretty severe deficiency of, of a macronutrient like nitrogen or so on, you, you end up with smaller leaves and less growth. And so you just see it in the NDVI. But if you want to know like uh, iron deficiency or, or mang manganese or magnesium or something that might have spots on the leaves, I don't think that you can, <laughs> I mean, I, I've seen papers where people do regressions and they have lots of field data and they train the imagery for that particular date, but by the time you did that, you're already past that date by a long ways, and I don't know how you use it in management. 